Can you say more about the neural part of this? I find this to be a very interesting piece. And out of all the pieces you've described, uh, and I agree with everything you've said, I, I know the least about that component yet. I've heard people talk about this, right, which is you cannot discount the CNS fatigue, literally, that, that comes from doing this type of work. And, and I remember as an example, um, watching sprinters train and obviously people understand that sprinters, I shouldn't say obviously, but, but if you under, if you, if you, if you study the mechanics of sprinting, you realize it really comes down to force per unit mass. Oh, yes. uh, it's how, fa it's how hard they can hit the ground with their foot relative to their mass. And so, you know, these are athletes who need to be you know, almost comically strong without gaining yeah. any excess weight. So even though we look at sprinters and we think, gosh, they're very muscular, um, it's their strength to weight ratio that's really profound. And so they have to train in a way that minimizes hypertrophy and maximizes strength. So for example, they'll focus heavily on exercises where they can push the eccentric phase, uh, pardon me, the concentric phase and not the eccentric phase. And it was explained to me once that doing this allowed them to also spare themselves from some of the neurologic fatigue. Uh, is there any validity to that or is that just true, true and unrelated? Um, and, and what is actually happening in, in both the, the, the central and peripheral nervous system during the recovery phase between those say three day or six day bouts when you're trying to recover a system after the set you just described? Yeah. I'm glad you brought up the peripheral. One of the big um, misconceptions is that there's muscular fatigue, connective tissue, systemic fatigue, blood vessels and everything still have to, heart has to pump. But then people just say, oh, and then the cent central nervous system. Well, the peripheral nervous system is a thing too, and it also takes substantial amount of fatigue. So I would just say um, the nervous system takes fatigue. And it takes fatigue in the same way you would expect any system that's pushed to its limits to take, various components of it experience wear and tear, various substrates deplete and need to be repleted. So I can bring up two examples. And uh, in the just generally kind of the, the axon of any single given nerve, you have a balance of electrolytes in an inside and outside, which allows the excitation contraction or sorry, which allows the proliferation of the electrical signal. But uh, you run that system long and hard enough and it starts to get out of whack to mm -hmm. where you try to get another impulse going and it's like, uh, <laughs> So it needs to do a lot of pumping to take what's supposed to be inside the cell that's now outside the cell to get back in there to a level of concentration that would, you would be fully recovered. Now, typically that happens quickly, but if you run that system a lot, there are various points at which some of the structures that are supposed to do that, they're also proteins. You use them enough and they start to kind of break a little bit and you need to produce more proteins to replace the channels themselves that do that pumping back and forth. And so that, you know, typically protein construction is measured on the order of minutes, hours, and days, not seconds. So that is a very, you could imagine it as like a transatlantic cable and like you throw enough current through a cable and the fish nibble at the cable enough, you need to start replacing the cable. Mm. Now, if you're really, really using the crap out of that cable, yeah, it's going to like un undergo some not so great things. And then closer to neuron to neuron junctions or the neuromuscular junction between the neuron and the muscle itself, you have vesicles of neurotransmitter. You pump enough of those in, you get the cool stuff of communication. You can run low on neurotransmitter and then like the electrical signal arrives and the neurotransmitter is like, sorry, not <laughs> enough of us to do anything. And so you experience profound weakness, which is expressed as, uh, or fatigue expressed as weakness. And you need time to reconstruct a lot of those neurotransmitters place them into vesicles, have those vesicles translocate to the synaptic cleft, and then like sit there and get ready. And that is a process that typically happens rapidly, but if you really exhaust it, it can happen over some time. Uh, really austere illustration of that is, and I've never done this, I've just heard about it. Uh, I will take credit for doing many other drugs, but I've never tried ecstasy. But if you clear enough of that neurotransmitter, you don't feel the same the next day. You feel different. And it takes a day or two to get back up to those levels. Similar types of mechanisms are at work when you are going to very close to true failure on, let's say, a squat or a leg press. I mean, you're cooking your muscles, but every single capacity of the nervous system to say, push, push, push is at maximum. And so you end up doing quite a bit of homeostatic disruption all the way along the axon, all the way through the cell body. And in the synaptic cleft, neurotransmitters getting everywhere, gunk building up. That's going to take some time to fix, which is why we see typically that people don't regain their prior strength after fatiguing in resistance exercise for 
depending on how hard you go, anywhere from several hours to several days. Mm -hmm. And so if you have really, really hard workouts, it just might take several days for you to be able to have a really, really hard workout again for that same muscle group. Luckily, because a lot of this is peripheral nervous system based and local musculature based, if you train the living crap out of your chest one day and your triceps, you can train back and biceps, which have nothing much to do with those movements, pretty robustly the next day. Much of the fatigue is local. It's not all local. The central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, specifically the brain, has a variety of mechanisms by which it controls your central fatigue. Um, I remember I think Tim Noakes was a big proponent of the central governor central model. Governor, yeah. And uh, though in the explicit terms which he described it might not be the case or somewhat close, there's absolutely central governing going on. And when your body can tell through a variety of mechanisms that like, you know, pretty messed up here, it's going to pull back on how hard you can do anything. And some of those neural structures might even be operating at full bore, but they're just degraded enough to where full capacity isn't full capacity anymore. And so in all those variety of ways and many others, your body after accumulating a certain amount of fatigue will need to back off. And if you think you can train ultra hard for the same muscles twice a day, every day, you are welcome to try it. In medical supervised context, you won't last. Uh, so it's really good that we have breaks planned in. But it's also really cool because weight training is one of those things where you get a dose of it and for days after under the hood, it's upgrading your body and your nervous system and your muscles and your tendons. So it's really neat that you can do 20 to 30 minutes of intense physical activity and resistance training and then for days later be experiencing the actual accrued benefits. Not a lot of things in life like that. It's kind of like getting a college degree for which you pay money and then earning money with it years later, ostensibly anyway. I've never <laughs> earned any money or had a college degree. But um, that's kind of how it works and, and you have to understand that when you're entering the gym, if you're training properly, you are asking a lot of your physiology. You are pushing it to its limits. If you're not, you're not using your time best and you're not getting the best outcomes because a lot of the absolute best results come from pushing very, very hard. Not necessarily to limits, but you have to test the limits, right? Like uh, from what I understand, you have a history of boxing. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So like if you just shadow box, it's nice. It helps. But going hard rounds against multiple fresh opponents, even if you're not like collapsing on the floor after, you know that like you're looking at the clock and you're like, <laughs> if you don't push it to that level at some point, you're not fight ready. So in order to be your best boxing version, every now and again, you have to push it to discomfort, grotesque discomfort. Same with the body. It's nice that you get to do that every now and again, and then you collect the benefits afterwards. It's so interesting how what we could do up to a certain age, and I don't know what that limit was because I really stopped pushing to those limits at about the age of 19. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if the limit was actually 20 or 21 or 24, but, but I never trained maniacally after the age of 19. Everything okay. I've done since 19 has been smoking and joking. Okay. <laughs> but what I could get away with then was ridiculous. Um, and I attribute it only to two things, right? Youth, obviously with youth, I mean stupidity and inexperience and all the things that come with youth, but also youth. like um, having started very young. So age 13 to 19, I was training literally six hours every day except Sunday. Sundays I only train two hours per day. And I look back at the workouts I did and I think like, I don't know how I did it. And more importantly, like how much better could I have been if I didn't train that much? But- It's a good question. These, like I, it wouldn't be uncommon for me to do six super hard rounds of sparring with two, with three fresh opponents. Yeah. One guy a weight class below me, one guy in my weight class, and then one guy for two rounds a weight class above me. In sequence? Yes. Six okay. straight rounds. You definitely did that backwards, but you probably know that now. No, I, well, I kind of wanted, it, yes, and I would mix it up sometimes, <laughs> yeah. but actually it was much harder and more dangerous to do it in that way, and I kind of liked that. Oh, right? boy. The idea, okay. that, that idea that the guy that could hit the hardest was my last guy. Yeah, when you were the most fatigued, yes, your defenses yes, yes. are the less accurate. Um, oh, geez. But I would be in the weight room six days a week. Sure. Like it was just running hard, you know. Anyway, it was kind of crazy, but um, I want to go back and just, put a bow on something you said before, because I think it's so important and it's going to come up again and again. I want to make sure people understand the point because I think your example was great, by the way. Um, the nonlinearity of force is very counterintuitive. It is not obvious why, for example, being on a bike, even if you are riding at a very high level of power, 
So remember on a bike, your leg is going around at 90 times per minute. So even if you did a one minute all out, that's 90 reps or call it 45 reps. That's nothing compared to when you're doing an all out set for 10 reps in the gym. It's such a difference in force. And the, I love the example of the wiffle ball going by you versus a 50 cal, mm -hmm. right? The 50 cal could kill you without hitting you. Mm -hmm. uh, the wiffle ball you wouldn't notice. So I think this idea of the profound level of difference in, in tissue destruction is, is a very important one. <laughs>